Hello, and welcome to the last of the films about the practical aspects of redox chemistry. Um, this deals with corrosion prevention, so in other words, how we stop rusting from happening, um, rusting in particular as a particular form of corrosion. Um, if you don't know what rusting is and you don't know how it happens, in other words, if you haven't watched the previous film and you haven't really understood it, um, then this film is going to be quite difficult for you to grasp. So um, before you start watching this one, I would suggest that you make sure you've got a good idea of what rusting is and how it happens. By the time you've watched this one, hopefully you'll know a number of different ways of preventing rust from taking place or rusting from taking place. And you'll know what some of the advantages and disadvantages are of the methods that we look at. Okay, um, well I suppose the, the oldest and the cheapest and the simplest way of preventing iron from rusting is simply to provide a physical barrier of some sort that prevents the surface of the iron from coming into contact with oxygen and water, which will cause the oxidation of the iron to start taking place. Um, a cheap way of doing this, a simple way of doing that, is just to uh, coat the surface of the iron with a layer of paint or with a film of grease or oil. Um, but what's often been done uh, is to coat the iron in a, a thin layer of an unreactive metal, like copper, say. Because the copper will take a long time to react and so it will provide quite a long-lasting physical barrier to the surface of the iron. The trouble with this is, and if you consider what the half equations that might be involved look like. Okay, If I write these in the order that they are on the data sheet and I look at copper, let's say I've coated my iron with a, with a film of copper, okay, um, we can see here that copper ions are a better oxidizing agent than iron ions. So in other words, it is feasible that iron will react whilst copper ions turn back into copper. Now, iron giving up these electrons is what has to happen in the first stage of iron rusting, right? Iron at the metal surface has to dissolve by giving up those electrons. Now, normally those electrons would go to the oxygen and the water. But if you've got something else around, that in addition to the oxygen and water can take those electrons away, you're actually going to accelerate the rate at which your iron rusts. So this is not a good thing. And in fact, as soon as oxygen and water come into contact with the surface of your iron, in other words, as soon as you scratch the surface of this copper, you're going to be promoting the corrosion of your iron. So this is quite a good method as long as the copper layer is intact. But as soon as it gets scratched or damaged, it's actually going to speed up the rate at which your iron rusts, which isn't a good thing. Now, <clears throat> If we don't use copper, if we use other metals, if we choose our metal carefully, we can actually provide a surface that, pre that prevents oxygen and water from reaching the surface of the iron, but can actually continue to protect the iron even after it's been scratched or damaged. And that's the beauty of galvanizing or coating in zinc. Now, be a little bit careful here because my list of reduction potentials is kind of upside down compared to what it looks like on the data sheet. But if we look at iron and zinc's standard reduction potentials, we can see that zinc's is quite a lot more negative than iron's, which means that zinc is better at giving up electrons than iron is. So if we've got oxygen and water around that want to take electrons, <clears throat> remember oxygen gets reduced, so it's gaining electrons, Oxygen and water will take electrons from zinc in preference to iron. In other words, the zinc will be the anode and the iron will become the cathode. <coughs> so, let's say I've got my iron surface which is coated in zinc. Okay, So here's some a zinc coating. Here's the iron underneath. This is supposed to be a scratch here and uh, oxygen and water kind of free to get in and touch the surface of the iron. The electrons that the oxygen and water want, well, they'll come from the zinc instead of the iron. So the iron is being forced to be the cathode. It's being forced to be reduced. It's being forced to turn into iron rather than back into iron ions. 
So you're preventing the iron from corroding, even after your zinc surface is worn away. It will, in other words, it will corrode in preference to the iron. So you're kind of sacrificing the zinc, in, safe in the knowledge that it's going to protect your iron from rusting. Now there are other forms of cathodic protection, so other ways of making iron be the cathode, and they're quite often used in ships and in underground pipelines. Now, ships which have great big iron hulls, uh, you don't really want them to rust, because if they start getting holes, then they don't really work very well anymore. So um, <clears throat> we use another form of sacrificial protection. In actual fact, you've probably, well, you maybe not probably, but you may well have seen these big lumps of metal attached to the hulls of ships. Often this is magnesium, which has a much more negative potential than iron. It's much better at giving up electrons. So <clears throat> lots of oxygen and water obviously in contact with the hull of your ship. But if iron is giving the electrons to that half equation, if it's providing these electrons here and allowing the oxygen and water to be reduced, then your, the hull of your ship won't rust. Your magnesium will corrode, you'll sacrifice your magnesium, but you're forcing your iron to be the cathode by making the magnesium the anode. And all you have to do is replace the blocks of magnesium rather than the whole hull of your ship. You don't want an underground steel pipe to rust, apart from the fact that it will leak. It's an incredibly difficult thing to get at once it's buried underground. But if you stick a magnesium rod in the ground and connect it to the steel pipe with a cable, then again, the magnesium will be the anode. It will be oxidized in preference to the iron. The steel pipe will become the cathode, right? <clears throat> And the electrons that this half equation requires will come from the magnesium instead of the iron, and your iron won't rust. All you have to do is replace your magnesium rod from time to time, but that's easy because it's sticking up out of the ground. Okay, so in both, or in all three of those methods of protection that we've looked at so far, we've sacrificed essentially a more reactive metal, or a a metal that's a better reducing agent than iron, in order to make the iron the cathode. But you don't have to sacrifice another metal. You can make the iron the cathode by other means too. Now here is a method of protecting jetties. Jetties nowadays often have steel legs instead of wooden ones because they don't rot, especially if you prevent them from corroding. They're obviously in contact with a hell of a lot of water and oxygen. But if you connect them via a wire to the negative terminal of a battery, you force electrons down this wire towards the iron, you're going to force it to be reduced, you're going to force it to be the cathode. You've got to complete this circuit, right? You've got a good salt bridge in the water. The external circuit, the electrons must be coming from somewhere, so you want something to be oxidized. You do want an external anode, right? But you can make that out of any kind of scrap metal you want, anything that you don't care about being corroded. So if you've got some scrap iron, you just connect that to the positive terminal of your battery. That will give up its electrons. It will corrode like crazy, but you don't care because it's scrap. And the electrons from it will go to the legs of the jetty and prevent your jetty from rusting, which is obviously a very good thing indeed. Okay, so <clears throat> lots of different ways of preventing rusting there, some better than others. Um, it's, again, it's not one of those things where you have to remember all these different things, but it's good if you can explain why different methods work in different ways, okay? It's important you understand what the meaning of cathodic protection and sacrificial protection is. Um, if you've got any questions about it, please come and ask or um, do me a favor and post some comments so that, um, the questions and answers are up there for future pupils to have a look at. Okay, um, but whichever way you do it, make sure that you understand before you move on.